joining us. Um, I'm thrilled today to be introducing Duncan McCargo, who uh, was a member of our Weatherhead East Asian Institute for many years, uh, teaching here in alternate semesters. He is now the director of the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies in Copenhagen. So while it's noon here, it's 6 p.m., it's lunch here and dinner there, early dinner in Copenhagen. <clears throat> Duncan is a political scientist, but also tries to write for non-political scientists. And he's written a great deal on all of Southeast Asia. But in particular, he's the leading specialist, I believe, in the world on Thai politics. He's written a great deal on Thailand. He's the originator of an important kind of dominant concept in the Thai political studies field called the network monarchy, which uh, if we want him to, we, we, if we want to ask him about it, we can. Um, he has in recent years published three very important books about Thailand. <clears throat> the first is this is not his first publication, but the first of his three more recent books is called Tearing Apart the Land, or is it, Duncan, Tearing the Land Apart? It is Tearing Apart the Land, yes. Tearing was. Apart the Land, which is- Slightly a, the other way around, yeah. Which is a, a very uh, revealing and important and wonderful deep study of the insurgency in Southern Thailand and the counterinsurgency in Southern Thailand based on field work that he undertook there for a long time and with some risk to himself, which won uh, the Bernard Schwartz Prize of the Asia Society in New York. And then just recently, I guess within the last half year or so, he published a book called Fighting for Virtue which is about the Thai justice system and injustice system. And now he's just come out with a really wonderful monograph called Future Forward, which is about a political party in Thailand called Future Forward that's just been banned recently. And this book is so timely because I'm sure all of you have been reading in the New York Times and elsewhere that there's been a long um, sort of youth demonstration against the Thai regime, which installed itself through a military coup and daring as well this youth demonstration to uh, touch the sensitive subject of the monarchy. And the future forward party kind of represents that generation that's carrying out these demonstrations. Uh, the, the relationship between it and the youth generation is something for Duncan to talk about and not me, but, but the point is that his book on this party gives us such necessary background into what's happening now in Thailand and gives us insight into what may happen in the future. So. We thought instead of Duncan giving a lecture that we would sort of start out with a conversation um, and that can be a conversation that includes all of you as well. If you would like to post your questions to the chat box on the YouTube page that you're looking at, um, the Weatherhead staff will forward those questions to Duncan and me, and we can fold that into our conversation. But of course, the first place to start with this conversation is to ask Duncan about his new book, um, show you a slide of the cover of the book. So maybe Athena, you can put that slide up and uh, tell us what's in the book and how, that, how he did the research and uh, how, uh, this uh, book relates to the events that he could not have foreseen when he did the book, but which have unfolded really just as the book was coming out and which are related to the things that he talks about in the book. So here we have a picture of the cover of this book, Future Forward, The Rise and Fall of a Thai Political Party. And 
the and who's that on the cover? That's the, the leader of the party, right? And is he okay or has he been arrested or what? So Duncan, if you would introduce yeah. the book, which I advise everybody to get a hold of, it's very fascinating and well-written. Okay, thanks. thanks. Thanks so much, Andy, for that very warm introduction. It's a great pleasure to be sort of back at Columbia and Weatherhead. I guess none of us is physically uh, at Columbia or Weatherhead uh, today. I'm, I am still affiliated, uh, I'd like to uh, stress, with, with the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. But yes, sadly, I've not been teaching at, at Columbia this past year because I, I made this move to, to Copenhagen. So it's great to have a chance to talk about this book. I should add that um, the book was written with uh, Anja Ratchatrakun, who is a colleague of mine. She's an affiliated researcher at the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies, did her PhD with me quite a few years ago, working on election campaigning in Thailand. Uh, so this was a collaborative project. But as uh, you'll all be aware, there's been this lockdown situation prevailing across uh, most of the world over the past few months. And uh, we wrote this book basically in 12 weeks after the Danish prime minister declared a lockdown on the 12th of March. And I haven't actually met Anya Rat for, for more than two years. Uh, we managed to, to write a book together without meeting and also to write a book about Thailand without going there. Um, and the whole thing was a kind of crazy adventure, but we'd already got the idea of writing the book before Future Forward was banned, which took place on my birthday on the 21st of February this year, uh, and before the lockdown took place. And then our, our challenge was how to, to make this happen. So what's, what's this book really all about? And by the way, it's, it's published by Nias Press, and you can find uh, information about the book on their website, and you can buy an ebook right away. You don't have to give any money to the richest man in America. You can give it straight to us. Uh, online from the Nearest Press website. Um, what's happening with this book? Well, as Andy said, I, I have been trying to reach out to different kinds of audiences in recent years, and I've done a lot of academic work of various kinds, um, and I wanted to use the academic research that, that I'd done and that Andy had done uh, to form a basis for a book that would nevertheless not wear that... Um, research too heavily. So all the notes are buried in the back of the book. You can read it without being, without having your eye, eyesight disrupted by uh, bracketed numbers and dates or little footnote numbers and things at the bottom of the page and so on. Uh, if you do get around to turning to the, the footnotes in the back of the, or the end notes in the back of the book, you'll find most of them are to social media and particularly to YouTube, which many of you are now watching this talk on. Uh, YouTube became our research site. Anirat and I have been doing kind of digital ethnography. So I had the chance to talk to Tanaton, the leader of the Future Forward Party, who you see on the cover, and a couple of the other leaders and some other people in the party. I'd interviewed them on a number of occasions um, and also was observing them during the election campaign, went to the party headquarters and did all that kind of standard um, qualitative political ethnographic research of the kind that I like to do. But that was all uh, in 2018 and 2019, not while doing this book. So why do we decide in the first place that we need to write a book about the Future Forward Party? Um, I guess long and short of that is that this is the most exciting thing to happen in Thai politics in recent years. Um, there was a military coup in Thailand in 2014. People like me who hoped that Thailand would move in a somewhat more open and progressive direction um, were rather frustrated by the second military coup in, in eight years. There was another one in 2006. And the first force that really emerged to articulate an alternative discourse about how Thailand should be after the coup in 2014 was this new Future Forward Party that was launched in 2018. So um, we tried to capture this phenomenon. It became, you know, an extraordinary two-year business because the party came from nowhere early in 2018. It won 81 seats and became the third largest party in parliament in the election that was held in March of last year. And then by February of this year, it was gone. Uh, and we tried to capture that, not just because of the Future Forward Party and its leaders and so on themselves, but because we felt like tapping into what was going on with Future Forward was in some way to address the sort of zeitgeist of what was changing and what was possible in Thailand's otherwise rather depressing politics of recent years. Mm. 
Do you want to go to the next slide, Duncan? Sure, yeah. Um, well, you can throw another question at me as you like, Andy. Oh, I see. Well, tell us about this guy who's on your cover. Where, yeah. where did he come from? Yeah, Tanaton. So Tanaton is, is the guy, you know, as far as the Future Forward Party is concerned. It's a little bit more complicated than that because as we explore in the book, we ended up with three leaders. There's Tanaton, who's the party leader, Pia Butt, who's... Um, on his right in this sort of cartoon picture that you see there. I think we're seeing the whole, I don't know if you, everybody else is seeing all the slides and um, we should just see the one uh, so you can get the, the thing a little more clearly. And then um, Banika, the, the party spokeswoman. So these three figures really epitomize the party. Tanaton's a, uh, a complicated character in various ways rather like the controversial former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat who reshaped Thailand's politics in the first few years of the 21st century. Tanaton's a billionaire businessman, uh, comes from an extremely wealthy family, and his father sadly died just around the time he was graduating from university, and Tanaton took over the family business and expanded it um, dramatically. They make uh, auto parts, uh, they have factories all over the place, including in the US and Australia. So for a certain kind of tie, he epitomizes this extremely successful narrative of the business person who knows how to make money and knows how to make things work. But the other side of Tanaton is that, you know, he's a sort of leftist business person on another level. He spent most of his undergraduate student days as a university activist. Uh, he was uh, president of the the Students' Union and Vice President of the National Students' Federation in Thailand. He was at the forefront of lots of protests, siding with farmers. Uh, he was really opposing capitalism and opposing people like him. So he emerges from this contradiction of being a, a, a guy whose family has a lot of money and who's personally made a lot of money for his family business, but is also motivated and animated by this idealism. He's also a kind of action man. He does these extreme sports, um, trying to, uh, you know, hike to the Antarctic and things like this. He's, he's a guy who's always pushing himself to his physical and mental limits. Uh, and this is an image that was very, very appealing to a lot of people. So um, that's a kind of paradox about the Future Forward Party. It's a party that's fighting against the personalism and dysfunctionality of Thai politics, but it seems to be fighting against the personalism and dysfunctionality by advocating uh, another sort of um, personality uh, focus in the form of the cult of Tanaton himself and the cult of his two fellow leaders, which becomes more and more pronounced as the two year period goes on. So you uh, said he's a bit leftist, a bit mm. idealist. -ish. Yes. Um, for us, that kind of computes to, I suppose, issues like the $15 minimum wage and stuff, you know, in, in the mm -hmm. United States. But yes. what, what are, and, and I know that toxins um, sort of uh, progressive position had mm -hmm. to do with, um, at least as I understand it, support for the rural ties. Yes. But putting some meat on the bones of this person's leftist idealism, what was he, uh, you know, uh, what were his main planks of his platform? Or was it really just personalism about I'm a glamorous person, vote for me? Right. He always said that it was not about him. Uh, and when I talked to him about, you know, the fact that he had a kind of cult following and fandom. And as you see in that picture with these people swooning around him and taking his photograph and getting his autograph and all this stuff, he is very ambivalent and, and rather disdainful about that stuff. He was uncomfortable with it you know, in many ways. Um, if you really look at what the ideas were that were articulated most explicitly during the election campaign by the Future Forward Party, to a large extent, it's what the party is against. The party was the the party that most explicitly criticized military rule, criticized the 2014 coup, said that the army had too much power, that the defense budget needed to be cut, that the system of conscription uh, was an abuse and should be corrected and changed. Um, other themes that come through, if you really go through the details of their, their manifesto, there's a lot of stuff about decentralization, about moving power out of Bangkok and to the provinces, giving people more control over their own affairs, and some talk about a welfare state, 
Um, but not that much talk about progressive taxation and, and minimum wages, interestingly. Not so many specifics of that kind in the, in the economic policy. So the tax and the, the struggle of the military against Taxon was the sort of red yellow, right? Uh, yes. Struggle had to do with right. an urban rural split, as I understand it. And is this a different split that's now taking place, or, or, or not now, but I mean, well, yes, now, but did the future forward party kind of create or come to influence over a different uh, axis of division, or was it a repetition of the same one? Right. That's a really, really good question. Well, you've seen the book and here it is again in, in, in real life. You'll see the cover is orange and or this is the future forward uh, color, orange. And of course, it doesn't take a great deal of reflection to realize that orange is either in between yellow and red or it's a blending of yellow and red. There's a very deliberate attempt by Tanaton and the future forward leadership to position themselves in a way that they could appeal both to people on the yellow side and to people on the red side. Uh, so their story was very much about, this is the old politics. Thailand has been suffering from this incredible and very disruptive and unpleasant polarization that really began in late 2005 with the very first yellow shirt protests and continued um, you know, explicitly until the, the 2014 coup, but the, 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 that sort of divide has continued to be there the whole time. So you've had 14 years of red-yellow polarization. And what Tanaton and Future Forward said was, we're going to move beyond this. We actually don't want to get caught up in that old story. We'd like to move forward, because the party's all up for move forward is now the uh, the name of the new party that was formed after Future Forward was, was banned. Uh, it's all very, very future oriented. So the idea is let's get beyond these divisions. Now, if you really come to analyze it, there's a sense in which a lot of the ideas that Tanatorn represent have some similarities with uh, the pro-Taxin parties in the sense that they were opposed, also opposed to the military. The pro-Taxin parties obviously were the biggest losers from those military coups in, in 2006 and 2014 that removed them from power. But Tanatorn was also very careful to say that he understood why people had been unhappy with with Taksin um, and that some of the ideas and values that Taksin represented weren't attractive to people. They were disengaged from the concerns of ordinary people. There were issues about corruption and so forth. So the Future Forward Party acknowledged those problems and tried to reach out to people who had been, especially in the 2013-14 uh, period before the coup in this anti-Taxin, anti-Yinglat government move, movement and said, we understand where you came from and why you are frustrated and we don't want to go to that politics. We want to go forward to something else. So that was all part of their very careful positioning. Of course, they were for that severely criticized by people uh, on the pro tax side, the, the core red shirt people for whom they had sold out uh, and were not really genuinely progressive. And of course, from people on the conservative yellow side who said, you're just faking it and pretending that you have something in common with us, but really you're just red people in disguise. So that's the problem with occupying that kind of center ground in a, in a situation where everything became polarized. But the fact that they got 6.3 million people uh, voting for them does testify to the fact that there was significant uh, receptiveness to that kind of message. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, I, I could go a little bit more about the other the, the other cleavages that you've mentioned. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the the urban rural was part of it. I mean, it's not straightforwardly urban and rural. Surprise, surprise. It's more nuanced and complicated than that. Uh, and also regional. You know, Taxon and his parties had very strong support in the north and northeast, whereas the uh, conservative side had much stronger support in the upper south and in Bangkok. Those divisions still exist. They haven't gone away. Um, but what Future Forward brought out, I think, was first a possibility of some middle ground, but also, and what, what, what we'll talk about, I'm sure, before too long, generational divide. Because if, if we want to see a new cleavage, a new mode of polarization, it's the idea of generational divide, which, which the Future Forward Party has very much brought to the fore. So Duncan, we've been sort of fiddling around trying to get your, you have a few slides trying to yes. get them up. I think we 
have now the slide that fits right into what you're saying. Right. So, you know, so uh, uh, go ahead and, and tell us who supports this movement and, and what you call blurred lines. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So, well, this is a picture I actually took at, at Tamasart University just before Tanatorn was going to go on stage for a live TV debate, which was a week before the election was actually held last year. Uh, an almost identical but not identical picture was used in the New York Times. So that was my, my biggest success of 2019 to get not just my article published, but my photograph published. Um, it, you know, a lot of people have said that Tanatol looks radiant, his shirts, the whiteness of his shirt seems to be unreal. Um, it, it does in some way capture the sort of magnetic attraction that he seemed to have for certain kinds of people. So I, I heard that he was going to be meeting some of his fans before this public event and uh, his staff told me roughly where he was going to be and I found him literally emerging from the bushes pursued by these eager people who were desperate to take pictures and selfies with him and get his autograph uh, he was barely able to get to the stage for the public event because he was more or less mobbed by these people and when we Anurat and I started to dig into who these people were in more detail we discovered there's a lot of crossover between k-pop you know Korean boy bands and the followers of Tanaton and the Future Forward Party. So some of the very same Twitter influences who were mobilizing people for Future Forward were actually the people who maintained fan pages for K-pop boy bands, which are absolutely huge in Thailand. So there's a strange <laughs> overlap between these two worlds, which again, Tanaton is, is, is very embarrassed about. And of course, the idea of followers is a very interesting idea because we have you know, classic political understanding of followers and people who support political parties. But of course, in the world of social media, which is incredibly important in, in um, bringing uh, future forward to greater levels of popularity, the idea of a follower, somebody who follows somebody on Facebook or follows somebody on Twitter or through other, some other social media platform is a very salient one. So um, I wish we had really good voting data in Thailand and we could tell whether uh, people of particular age groups were really those who voted for Future Forward, but unfortunately there are no uh, exit polls conducted to any kind of uh, serious international or even domestic standard in Thailand. We have very limited uh, information. We have some retrospective polling that was done by some people, uh, which suggests that a, a very high proportion of the first time voters under 25 did vote for Future Forward but we can't absolutely um, prove that. And there weren't enough full-time voters to get to 6.3 million. Uh, what was also very interesting, and Anirat did some great research on this interviewing families, uh, was that a lot of these young people persuaded their parents and even their grandparents to vote for Future Forward as well. So, mm -hmm. and, and some of the people who persuaded their parents were not themselves of voting age. So, whereas in the past, older people would be telling the younger people in the family who to vote for, we saw a reversal of that phenomenon with Future Forward, which is all part of this interesting generational uh, contestation and up upending that's taking place. So is this uh, chiefly rural young, uh, sorry, urban young people, or does it cross over the urban, rural, and regional divides mm -hmm. that you have, have talked about? This was the thing that was very interesting. We were kind of assuming, isn't this sort of a Bangkok urban middle-class phenomenon? But if you look at the distribution of Future Forward's votes, I mean, the reason why they got 50 party list MPs was because people were voting for them all over the country. Um, and you have to have voters in every district and every uh, province in order to reach that level of, of support. Um, so the other interesting thing is we had two research assistants for our project, one of whom was from uh, a fairly um, you know, upper middle class Bangkok family, another one of whom was from an extremely ordinary family of uh, farmers in the Northeast. And you'd have expected some kind of significant difference of political attitude or understanding between these two. But it turned out that both of our research assistants saw completely eye to eye on almost everything about the politics of Future Forward and viewed what was going on in the country in almost exactly the same way. I think this is really, really interesting that the generational divide and the generational affinity for this kind of politics crosses over uh, what would previously have been 
a class and regional divides between, and I remember taking some of my Bangkok students to the Northeast in the 1990s, and they could barely have a conversation with local people. They seem to be from another planet, but this is not true with this young generation. They're communicating on very, very equal terms through social media, and politically, they're on exactly the same page. Striking. So, um, how, how was, uh, let me ask you a three-part question. Uh, the military has mm. its own, the military government or the, what, the, so the current government is actually not a military government, right? Because Chan Ocha stepped out of the military to be a civilian. Am I right or wrong about this in order to be prime minister? But they have, in any case, they have a political party and Toxin had a political party and this is a third political party and how, I would imagine, and I'm not a Thai specialist, obviously, that the older parties have local organizations or clientelistic networks, or they have some organizational form that through mm -hmm. which they mobilize their voters. But what about, the, but when you're just a new party based in youth, it, it must be very difficult to have yeah. like party branches all over the country. So how does it work? Yeah. Thanks for that. Maybe, uh, Athena, we could go to the party slide, which is the next one. Let me just talk a little bit about Future Forward as a party. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the present government and Priyut Chanachar are a little bit complicated stories because Priyut stopped being army commander in uh, 2014 or so, you know, soon after the, the military coup. So he's been technically a civilian most of the time that he was heading a military hunter, just to confuse things, although still always referred to as general um, in the Thai context. Um, but yes, it's absolutely the case that um, the military formed this party, the Palang Visharat party, which then became the second largest party in parliament for this election. So if we go back to previous elections and the last properly conducted and completed previous election was in 2011, you saw a pattern which, which was pretty much the same in 2001, 2005, 2007 and 2011. Two parties were fighting it out. One was the Democrat Party, which was the party of the, if you like, the more conservative, older elite and the bureaucracy. And the other was under different names, a pro-Taxin party um, with its base of support in the North and Northeast. What happened in this election was that the, these two parties, which thought of themselves as being the main rivals, were outflanked on either side. Uh, the military formed their own party, Palang Bisharat, this new party. And a lot of people said, well, why would we bother voting for the Democrat party? Um, we'll just go and vote for this pro-military party if we want to have Priyut as prime minister. And that's what they did. So the Democrat party lost dramatically uh, in the election. And then the pro-Taxin parties, which had assumed that they could really triumph in any electoral system because they were so popular and they would be number one and they would be in a very, very strong position to uh, create a government coalition. I mean, they're still the biggest party, but only just. Um, and a lot of their support seeped out to, to Future Forward. So you ended up with the two new parties at opposite ends of the spectrum, the sort of ultra-conservative Palang Bisharat party and the very progressive uh, Future Forward party turned out to be much more dynamic and much more interesting than their predecessor parties of occupying bro broadly similar in some ways ground. And this came as a massive surprise to Purtai, the pro taxin party, who have not been at all uh, delighted to see themselves upstaged and outperformed in many ways by this upstart party, bearing in mind that none of the people in the Future Forward Party had ever been an MP before. None of them have been in Parliament. None of them had the slightest idea how to conduct themselves. I mean, they were just ab initio, <laughs> day one, just walking in. Um, OK, what are we going to do here? And a lot, uh, many of them were only in their 30s or even younger. So this was a massive shock to the system, both for the existing parliamentarians and for Future Forward themselves. I mean, they drew up this party list of people, but people who were number 50 on the Future Forward party list never imagined they were going to parliament. Uh, not in their wildest dreams. It was only the people in the top 10 or 15 who thought they had a decent chance of being elected. So you ended up with all these people who never expected to be MPs at all, suddenly finding themselves in parliament. How did it happen? Um, you know, they didn't, I mean, Anurat's PhD was all about how you win a normal election in Thailand, which is about having these 
networks of local vote canvassers who know all the village headmen and the teachers and the monks and the influential characters and go around dishing out money and favors and calling in um, you know assistance from whoever can help um, and you know future forward said from the beginning we're not going to have these vote canvassers we're not going to use this system you'll vote for us because you like us they essentially campaigned on a national platform based on the image of the party leadership and these ideas of we stand against the military and for democracy and uh, for a different set of values and that's how they they won most of the seats that they won not on the basis of their local candidates and we talked to a lot of people who said we voted for future forward despite the completely useless local candidate you know, we weren't interested in their local candidate at all. Uh, we just like the national platform of the party and the, the image of Tanatorn and the leadership. So this, this is one of the ideas we explored in the book and it was sort of my starting point when I thought about writing a book. Um, there's a, a book that came out last year by a guy called Paolo Gibardo talking about the digital party. And he argues that there are all these new kinds of parties that have emerged in Europe. Um, various kinds like the five star party or these pirate parties that we have here in the nordic region that are kind of anti-parties but that became very successful as a result of what he calls the hyper leaders and then their digital operations and their ability to reach out to voters through social media so they didn't need a conventional uh, party structure and to some extent future forward was like that of course when i asked tanaton if they were a digital party he was quite unhappy with the idea, uh, saying that, no, we have lots of people on the ground, there are real people, you know, our party is grounded in, in, in reality. They did open branches in every single province in Thailand, staffed by just one person. Um, so they had, an, you know, a, and a skeleton party structure. But it has to be said that party structure compared to Purtai or the Democrat Party was very minimal. Um, and yet they managed to do incredibly well and indeed better than the Democrat Party, which is very proud of its long-standing network of branches all over the country. So it did suggest that you can organize your party in a very different way, but it can't be entirely digital. These are some of the souvenirs they produced, by the way, which are quite, quite fun. I wish I'd bought a complete set of the souvenirs. I do have one or two of these items, I confess, but uh, uh, yes, I suppose we won't be able to get those anymore now that the party's been banned. So how, how did they um, get banned? What did they do to get banned? Yeah, so from the get go, um, you can imagine this party that kept challenging the military and saying very, very assertive things about the way the country was run and also criticizing large business companies in Thailand, which they accused of having monopolistic concessions and practices. You can imagine that there are quite a lot of powerful people who were quite eager to see the back of uh, Future Forward. So they very quickly had a whole series of charges leveled against them uh, on different grounds, um, both the party leaders and the party itself. And of course, Thailand has this interesting system um, whereby if political parties are deemed to be in violation of certain election and other laws, the election commission can recommend not just that they be punished or that individuals in the party should face some kind of disciplinary action or that they be fined or something like that but the election commission can actually propose to the constitutional court that the party should be banned and future forward is in fact the ninth party to be banned in thailand since 2006 so this mm -hmm. has been a standard operating procedure the complete banning of and dissolution of political parties, uh, which to most of us would seem rather heavy handed. In the past, two of Taksim's parties were banned and all the party executive members, sort of people on the sort of managing committee of the party were given five year bans from holding political office. But for this new round after the, the new constitution that came out in 2017, the, the length of uh, political banning was increased, doubled in fact. So now Tanaton and the other leaders of the party are banned from holding any political position for 10 years. And the, you know, the proximate reason for their ban was all to do with loans. Um, you know, they didn't have enough money to fund this party. And of course, most Thai parties are funded by dodgy money, which is not accounted for and is mostly uh, in cash and is dished out at election times and, and leading figures in the parties are basically money bags characters who carry cash around and get things done with that money. Um, and Future Forward wanted to be much more transparent. So although 
Tanaton has a lot of money and he could clearly have done things differently. He decided um, that what he wanted to do was to loan money to the party in a very transparent way. And he published information about this money that, that was being loaned to the party. Um, now, the party law in Thailand doesn't say anything about loans. It only talks about donations. Despite the fact that the party law doesn't make it illegal to make a loan, as far as you could see, um, the Constitutional Court decided that, in effect, Tanaton's two large, all of them very large, loans to the parties were de facto donations. And on that basis, they were of an excessive size, again, despite the fact that the size of the donation is not really specified anywhere in the law. And for that reason, Future Forward was banned. Um, the interesting thing is a large number of other Thai political parties were recently exonerated, despite the fact that they have also received significant loans from other sources. Future Forward is the only party that's been penalized in this way for taking a loan from someone, in this case, the party leader. So Future Forward's eagerness to embrace a new kind of transparency and to tell everybody about the loans that they were made by their party leadership as opposed to not tell everybody about the black plastic sacks full of thousand baht bills, which have been dumped in the <laughs> storerooms of the, of the party uh, vote canvases, um, was their undoing by admitting that they'd had these loans and being upfront about them. Uh, this formed a basis of the legal case. But interestingly, um, most of the well-known professors of Tamasat University Law Faculty, which is a very conservative law faculty from which uh, a lot of Thai judges graduate, issued a, a statement, I think 38 of them signed this statement saying that the, there was no legal basis to the constitutional court's reasoning. And this is fairly extraordinary because most of those law professors, some of whom I know personally, have absolutely no sympathy for the Future Forward Party. They're completely at the other end of the political spectrum, but they couldn't believe that anybody could concoct such a ridiculous legal argument as the so-called legal argument that was presented by the constitutional court. Um, so. Yes, this is where my previous project about politics and justice kind of meets the, the future forward project. It, the, the case was a nonsense. It was a piece of legal nonsense. Uh, mm. Almost everybody agrees about that. I've only interviewed one person who claims that there was any uh, kind of logic uh, and, and, and sensibility to this case. So is, is Tanaton or any of the other leaders, are they safe? Are they under arrest? Are they at risk of being disappeared or anything like that? Can they just turn around and organize another party under another name? Right, so this is the, this, the, this is the part two and part three and part four of the whole thing. So they have organized another party. Uh, this is the, so this is where Thai politics is quite strange. On the one hand, the constitutional court has these draconian powers to ban parties uh, and it does it all the time. And there was another party that was banned last year in the middle of the election. So this is regularly done. But at the same time, the implicit understanding is that after your party's banned, you are allowed to open a new party with all the same people in it, other than those who were not on the existing list of executive members. So Future Forward relaunched as a new party called Move Forward, which now has 54 MPs in parliament, all of whom were previously Future Forward MPs. Um, of the, those who disappeared between 81 and 54, there's a bit of a gap. Some of those are the people who were banned, but others are people who actually defected to rival political parties in the government coalition. And, you know, I don't want to commit any legal transgressions here, but, um, you know, there are many rumors of financial incentives for politicians who wish to defect from one party to another in the Thai context. So we can, we can guess at what happened to some of those people. But we now have a residual party called Move Forward, which contains many of the same people in the original Future Forward and is continuing to behave in much the same way. Officially, Tanaton is not allowed to communicate with that party in any way and have any continuing involvement in it. Uh, the Secretary General of the party is one of Tanaton's best friends. So we don't know what kind of communication they still have, but. We have to assume that if they're not actually communicating, they're very much on the same page. Then the other thing that Tanaton and the leaders did was create a new organization, which is not a political party, which they call the progressive movement. So they have turned themselves from a party into a movement. And I think this was a kind of tension within Future Forward from the beginning. Did they want to be a political party or did they want to be um, 
a movement that would operate outside parliament um, as a political party, you could see them as reformers who were trying to change the system. But as a movement, you could see them as disruptors who were really trying to disrupt the narratives and change people's way of understanding what was going on in Thailand politically. And I think in some ways, the, the, the agenda of the progressive movement is what's come to the fore. Interestingly, though, um, Tanatorn and the other leaders of the progressive movement aren't at the forefront of the current student protests, even if the current student protests in some ways seem to echo and then continue some of the themes of the progressive movement. But the other thing the progressive movement is doing is running political candidates in local elections, because if you run in local elections in Thailand, you're not affiliated with a political party. So the progressive movement has actually put up candidates for um, provincial administrative organization elections in a large number of provinces around Thailand. So they're in fact on the campaign trail now. They're banned from politics, but they're engaging in politics of a different kind. Hmm. Um, I want to encourage people who are listening to go ahead and pop some questions if you want to into the chat box on the YouTube page. But uh, Duncan, you just mentioned the demonstrations and I was thinking to, to ask uh, about that, how, and I guess I would have a, a, a multi-pronged question there, you know, sort of what is, uh, so moving from the future forward party and the movement to a more sort of macro or system mm -hmm. level perspective on what's happening, I guess I have part one of my question is what's mm -hmm. driving this move? What, what is the movement really? Is it, We think right. of it as a youth movement. I mm -hmm. think of it as an urban youth movement. Is that right? What's driving it? And then I want to know how much of a threat this movement or whether the demonstrations or the progressive movement that Tanatan and his people are mm -hmm doing or you know what's happening how much of a threat is it to number one to the the Prayut government yeah. number two to the monarchy right uh number three to toxins movement or is that mm. already dead or is is that dead or are they yes. okay. kind of replacing yeah. that movement as the progressive wing of Thai politics so that Toxin is kind of finished because he's been sort of superseded by something that's more, more modern and, uh, and more. Right. So that's a big, big bunch of questions. Yeah. And maybe you want to move to the next slide or to any yeah, other maybe the next slide and uh, try to, yes, those are all really good questions. And there are a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where do we start in Where all to start? What is going on here? Um, and it's not that easy to, to, to piece it all together. So, uh, where are we? Okay. Um, what's very interesting about these, the, the protests actually began initially the day after the banning of Future Forward. So Future Forward's banned on the 21st of February. On the 22nd of February, protests begin to break out on university campuses and most interestingly high school campuses, which do initially uh, seem to be triggered by this banning of Future Forward. And as, as we've said, it, it seems like a very high proportion of first time voters did support the Future Forward party. And there's a feeling on their part that um, by banning the Future Forward party, their representation had been taken away. We knew that the Future Forward was not in the government, it was an opposition party, but in many ways it was performing, it seems to me, for the, for the military and for the ruling elite in Thailand, quite a useful function because they could say, well, look, you may not be in power now, but you're in parliament, you're saying all these things that we don't like, and you know we have to listen to them a bit and make some kind of acknowledgement of them. So uh, you know, we found a, a, a way in which your views can be represented. We're going to continue running things more or less as we are, but you can say these obnoxious things about us and we're not going to stop you. Once you've banned the party, then people no longer have a voice in the conventional political system. I think that's a big part of, of what's gone on here. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering your questions very systematically, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so what is this all about in relation to uh, the existing polarizations and contestations? I think 
the, the the generational thing comes out very very strongly from these protests it's not entirely young people who are protesting now because there are other people who joined them and other people who share the same ideas but one of the most interesting conversations i had during all the research about future forward was my very first visit to the future forward party when i met the then leader of the new generation the new gen wing of future forward is this extremely articulate and animated 25 year old woman called Nana, um, who is a board game designer and has all kinds of interesting uh, talents and, and, and skills. She's a very, very interesting person. But she explained to me that Future Forward was actually established to oppose hierarchy and what she calls senioritism. She said that the core of what Future Forward was about was overturning deference and basically telling older people to get stuffed. Uh, and that, that was the point of the party. Uh, the following year, I, uh, when I uh, we had Tanatorn at a public event at LSE, and I said I quoted the, uh, these exact Thai words back to him in public and asked him if it was true that Future Forward was established to oppose hierarchies and seniority. And he didn't really seem to relate to that idea very well. Interestingly, Nana, the woman who proposed this idea, herself quit the Future Forward Party early on and has since denounced the party as a patriarchy and um, said that it was actually being dominated by this small clique of leaders who didn't really want to hear the obnoxious voices of people like her. Uh, so there's a kind of, it, within the Future Forward Party, there's a kind of miniature version of the national politics which then starts to play out in, in 2020. So although Tanator may be progressive, um, you can also, from the point of view of these younger people, say that he's now started to become a more conservative figure in his own right. So, yeah, you've got Taksin starting off criticizing the military and opening up some of these issues. Then you've got Future Forward coming along and saying we have to take on this agenda in a different way for a new generation and uh, be more challenging in certain respects. And um you know, really question a lot of assumptions about the existing system. And then you have these young people, including high school students, who are saying, we don't really need people like Tanatorn anymore. This guy's over 40. He's basically ancient. He's not representing us. Um, there was a point where most of the, back in August and early September, the students wouldn't allow anybody over 23 on the stage. Um, so, you know, so if you're that old, you it's shades of the Cultural Revolution, actually, in some ways, it's an intense distrust of uh, people above a certain age. So um, what we've seen with the high school protests and things is high school um, students challenging their teachers and standing up in history lessons and saying, how can you tell us these lies about history? We know that these Thai kings weren't that great, or we know that in, in on the 6th of October, 1976, these things happened, and we just read it on our phones, and we read this stuff in English, and we got it from the internet. And what do you know? Do you know more than us? Why are you standing there teaching us when we know more than you do? You're just telling us a pack of government lies. And, and so teachers in school people in, in positions of seniority who are used to deference in Thai society have been finding that deference disappearing over the past few months in an alarming way, a way that they've found incredibly disconcerting and don't really know how to process. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary phenomenon, especially in the context of, you know, for those of you who don't know so much about the Thai language, but this is similar with a number of other Asian languages, you can't address somebody in Thai without knowing whether they're older or younger than you. Mm. Lang you know, seniority and age is deeply embedded into every social interaction. This, this why the Thai greeting is all uh, choreographed based on your relative age and importance differential with the person that you're greeting and being greeted by. So everything about the way you interact with people in Thailand is based on a sense of hierarchy and seniority at the most fundamental level before you get into anything overtly to do with political power. Any social interaction uh, has these things deep within it. And you've got kids who are basically saying, we, don't, we can't be doing with this anymore. We're fed up of it. We're not listening to you. You don't know any more than we do. Actually, we know more than you do. And when that rolls on beyond, you know, rebellions against high school uniform and the right of teachers to tell students to get their hair cut and things like that, to uh, challenging the political system, the military, and then into the, the really big stuff about monarchy and so on, basically all the assumptions that have held 
tie society together in a certain kind of way in previous decades are now being overturned. And this is why I've just applied for a couple of research grants, as, as Andy knows, to, uh, to study what I call Generation Z, New Asian Cosmopolitans and the rise of digital natives, because I believe that this is where uh, the action is in terms of understanding what's going on politically, not just in, in Thailand, but in lots of other places in Asia and around the world. Should we look at the next slide for that concept of generation? Oh, that might be good, yeah, that might be good. But um, as, you, as you talk about this, I'm trying to think of any example. So the Cultural Revolution was not um, what was um, the youth movement, the Red Guards and so forth in the Cultural Revolution were competing for their loyalty to Mao Zedong. Mm, yes, it was, it was a mobilized from the top. Right. The uh, 1968 student movements in France and the United States and so forth were mm. um, were youth movements, but they were against the Vietnam War or against right. I forget yeah. what the French movement was. But um, I'm trying to think of any movement against deference as such mm. or against right. seniority as such right in uh, uh, of course teenagers in the family would mm -hmm. often take that position but to right. have a national political movement which is simply i suppose one might think of the may 4th movement in china as something mm -hmm. that was against all of confucian culture something yes. of that kind uh, but that was also a nationalist move. I, I just can't, uh, right. can't think of anything <laughs> that ever happened that was like this. And now you're saying, um, and so, so is there something like this? And then you seem to be implying that it's a pan-Asian phenomenon as well that has something to do with the age of the internet. So I'm really scratching my head quite literally here. Yeah, um, yeah to try to think what is this a, a, an example of, or is it so right. generous and something rather new? Yeah, it is in many ways rather new. Of course, there's, a, there's an iconoclasm, which is a bit like the Cultural Revolution or 68, but no, the, the, the whole ideological package that goes with it is, is hard to find an exact parallel for, and that's what makes it so interesting. But I think if we look at Hong Kong, if we look at this Milk Tea Alliance, which I think many people watching this may be familiar with, the idea of a, a virtual identity shared by people who are resisting Chinese authoritarian domination as they see it in the Asia Pacific region. Um, these are examples of a similar kind of phenomenon. And what you know, my interlocutors in the, in the Future Forward Party in the early days tried to persuade me was that digital natives, people who really grew up online, as opposed to people like me who started off by reading books and at a certain point in my adult life, tried to migrate unsuccessfully uh, to online activity. So I'm always going to be a digital immigrant. Uh, mm -hmm. That actually people under 25, it's almost as though their brains are processing information, ideas and, and notions of respect, deference and authority and knowledge differently because of this, the different way that they have grown up understanding things. And this is a, a kind of a hypothesis at the core of this, which I have not yet explored. If someone gives me 3.5 million euro, 2.5 million euro or, or 6.2 million Danish krona, I may be able to get a bit further with it. But this is the kind of idea I think is incredibly interesting. So uh, one of the questions that I, we have a question from a, 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 listen, a, a viewer but that kind of connects to a question that I already asked you that you haven't gotten around to answering, which is, Sorry, who, yes. <laughs> yeah, which is, that's fine. It takes time yes. to un unroll all of these implications. But the question, my big question was the threat that this poses uh, to uh, the current government, to the monarchy, to the toxin movement, or to whoever, to the American Alliance or to whatever. And then the question that we have from the, from the YouTube listener is how do you see the impact of the protest on foreign firms in Thailand? So this is another kind of threat question, threat dimension. In other words, overseas automobile firms, things like that that are operating in Thailand, would political regime change or transition of the prime minister affect 
the regulation or business environment of these foreign firms that are operating in Thailand. So is the movement anti-foreign? Is it um, you know, nationalistic in some way? You, you identify it as cosmopolitan. Are they, do they have any foreign policy point of view? But also like, are they, are they squeezing out the toxin party? Are they gonna overthrow mm. Priyut? And um, I suppose to, to make the question even more complicated, we know that there have been some, that the government is trying to suppress these protests, yes. partly with water cannons, as I right. remember, and partly with les majeste prosecutions. Yes. Yeah. And can we expect a sort of Tiananmen type bloodbath to take place potentially? Or would, would Prayut right. retire or, you know, what's, what does the future hold? We, we do, the past is too easy to answer. I know, right? Okay, well, that was about at least another 10 questions, yeah. any one of which could probably be the basis of another article, if not the book. And of course, what everybody always wants to know is what's going to happen next. Um, so where do I start with? Um, what kind of threat is this? I think it's a very, very fundamental threat if you believe that it is what I'm suggesting it might be. I mean, if you think this is a movement of people who are not happy with the present government or even um, you know, would like to see certain kinds of reforms of the constitution or even reforms of the monarchy and so on, then maybe it's a threat that's manageable. But if you actually believe that uh, you've got a generation of people whose brains are different and they don't really accept the, the essential way in which society is ordered and notions of deference and hierarchy, which is governing everything about Thailand, then it's very, very threatening to the people who are running the country because it's you can't really assuage these people and over time there'll be more and more of them. Um, so even if you manage to suppress them now with water cannon or whatever, uh, or less majesty charges or any other mechanisms, sooner or later these people are gonna do you in because you're gonna be dead and they're gonna take over. So it's just, you're just holding back, you know, just holding back this force, which you might be able to do for five or 10 years. But if, if digital natives really are what they might be, uh, then uh, all these elites are gone. It's just a matter of when is how long they can hang on. Um, so that's a really, a really, really threatening situation. And yes, it's threatening to everybody and it's threatening to um, the pro taxin side, which has seen itself as being the legitimate voice of people in the regions and people who are more disadvantaged and marginalized and the red shirt movement, because they don't really know where to put themselves. The military successfully suppressed the red shirt movement in the coup of 2014. And despite all these claims that it was gonna come back and, and be an important force again, it just hasn't happened. The red shirt movement insofar as it exists is now to a large extent becoming engaged by these protests and some elements of the red shirt movement are sort of independently joining the student protesters. But this is all very awkward for Taksin because the red shirt movement was very much a movement about supporting him and supporting Yinglak. And the student movement is not about supporting him or Yinglak or Tanatorn or anybody else. And it's also, this is where the Hong Kong parallel is very interesting, deliberately designed to be leaderless. Um, all the main figures in the movement that we saw in the first few weeks or so have been pretty much arrested. Some of them have been bailed out again. But the movement has demonstrated that it has a flexibility and a capacity to resist the arrest of its leaders and to reinvent itself in new ways that the authorities don't really understand how to handle. So they've tried all kinds of things, um, legal charges, the water cannon. There was a big backlash against the water cannon. Um, well, we thought they probably wouldn't do that again for a while. They have done it again. Um, they, don't want, they don't know what to do with these students. And the other problem is there aren't any leaders that you can negotiate with. So how would you, how would you get them to um, stop protesting? And their demands are kind of incoherent as well. And they're talking about constitutional reform and resignation of the prime minister and dissolution of parliament and all this stuff. But how is that going to change things in a very fundamental way? Um, because in many ways, their goals are more at the disruption than the reform end and the the most radical of the student groups have in many ways been the ones that are driving much of the agenda. So it's complicated. What does this mean for foreign business? That's always a, a, a question that lots of people want to know the answer to. I mean, if you think the Thai economy is currently uh, rather distorted by some of the monopolistic practices of um, 
the way in which concessions in certain kinds of businesses are handed out, then, you know, if you could overcome those monopolies and allow more competition in certain sectors of the economy might be transformed and there could be an opportunity for all kinds of other people because thailand is one of the world's most unequal countries a very small number of families control huge sectors of the economy and that tendency has only got worse over the past few years so that could in theory change but it's hard to see how you could make a nice smooth easy transition to a more open politics and a more open economy uh, based on where we are at the moment because there are a lot of steps to to, to pass through and a lot of people with a very strong interest in maintaining the status quo who are going to be extremely reluctant to sacrifice their privileges. I think we can um, take off, take down the PowerPoint and see yes. Duncan in a okay. large, large format. Yeah. So, um, so Anne-Marie Murphy asks, can you comment on the implications of this generational divide on Thai foreign policy? There's been much discussed about Milk Tea Alliance. What might a generational Generation Z foreign policy be? And I guess um, in that connection, I wonder whether the US embassy has taken any position. I mean, under some American regimes, the embassy would be urging a democratic solution, you know, having yes. a human rights position, but uh, I don't, I, I imagine that the American administration right now doesn't really care about Thailand one way or the other. So the foreign policy aspect, both Thai, Thai foreign policy and, and US. Yeah. Policy. I mean, I'm not the best qualified person to talk about the US position. Of course, there is a, a political appointee as ambassador uh, to Thailand at the moment, so it's a slightly different situation from uh, under previous administrations, and perhaps it's all going to change very soon, I don't know. Um, of course, the US has, as usual, been blamed by the uh, conservative establishment for fomenting this dissent and uh, for being behind it, and there are all kinds of conspiracy theories and demonstrations against um, you know, American interference. It seems pretty straightforwardly clear, though, that this these demonstrations have very little to do with foreign interference and everything to do with the aspirations of um, local young Thai people. Uh, at the same time, they are cosmopolitan in the sense that they're connected. There is inspiration coming from what's been going on in Hong Kong from this Milk Tea Alliance. They have an orientation towards a more open and democratic a set of, of values. Uh, I don't think they, they align nicely with you know, US influence or European influence or Nordic influence or British Australian influence or, or Japanese influence or anything like that. But I think you can see um, that the rise of this generation is, um, you know, it's not, it, these are not people who are going to be sympathetic to a more authoritarian um, mode of politics. That's exactly what they're resisting. So they're calling out the authoritarian tendencies of, of the the domestic regime and, and challenging them on their international links. But yeah, I think at the moment they're, they're, they're primarily struggling to figure out what their actual domestic demands and agenda is. They haven't quite, they haven't quite got to forming a foreign policy yet. Yes. But we can imagine that the foreign policy um, would be a more, a more Western leaning one than, uh, than say a, a pro-China foreign policy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we, we have a question from Gibson Haynes, what prospects are there for constitutional change? Uh, having shut down the first vote two weeks ago, does this close the door on amendment? Yeah, they, 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 this, they've gone back and forth with this. I mean, there are still a couple of um, options in play for a constitution a drafting process. So the more critical options were the ones where, you know, for example, ILO, this um, NGO had got I think 100,000 signatures in the end on a petition which was calling for some fairly specific reforms to be built into a constitution uh, drafting process. Uh, now that that has been rejected by Parliament, so there were seven different alternative ideas floating around, but two of them are still in play. The ones that are in play are the more conservative ones, but they basically, you know, the most conservative ones are you know, we just make it possible for a constitutional assembly to be set up and then take it from there. Um, so the possibility of redrafting the constitution is really still there. It's just that what we've seen is that rather than 
the Priyut government deciding to roll over and let this thing take its course and go whichever whichever way it wants. They've de they've demonstrated a willingness to to try and block off some of the more radical options. And the other thing is that a lot of people thought that uh, seemed to believe that the Senate, uh, which is an appointed body, basically appointed by General Priyut and his uh, associates in the the post-2014 Hunter was somehow going to vote for its own abolition or the removal of all of its own powers. And I think it was always rather optimistic to imagine that this bunch of extremely conservative people would just be delighted to give up their privileges uh, and, and walk away, um, leaving the coast clear for some other people to come and take their place. And surprise, surprise, they have been fighting a rear guard action against that. So um, it's messy. Uh, the, the difficulty is that the protests have been going on for months. They show no particular signs of really having been uh, dampened seriously. They're going on all over the country, by the way. Most of the focus has been on what's been happening in Bangkok, but there have been smaller scale protests in almost every province of Thailand. Um, so this movement isn't going away uh, in any way. And if the government doesn't address it by allowing a constitution, a constitutional reform process to go forth, I, I don't know what other options they have. Uh, and they're presumably trying to figure out what they can get away with at this point. So you you said a couple of times that the movement is not going away, but um, coming from the China mm -hmm. perspective on things, if yep. the regime is unified and determined, I mean, the Chinese regime seems to have shown the ability to crack down yes. uh, effectively uh, in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang, in right. Tibet, in Chinese cities. Um, if, well, let me connect this to the question of the network monarchy, your, you know, this uh, yep. concept that's associated right. with you. Uh, right. And I'm tempted to define the network monarchy for the audience, but then I'm afraid to do so in front of your face. <laughs> yeah, right. so, so why don't you tell us what this concept is, but I understand that it refers to a rather, uh, you know, tight <laughs> uh, uh, combination of all the most powerful interests in the society. So why shouldn't we be pessimistic? You're being rather optimistic when you say that this movement is not going to go away. Why? Why cannot the network monarchy, the whole apparatus of power, just come in and absolutely crush it? Yeah, well, so look, tell, that, tell everybody what the network monarchy is, just in case there's anybody who doesn't. <laughs> okay. <know. Yes. laughs> um, right. Well, clearly, lots of different things could happen, and I should say we end our book with four scenarios, and I could talk about the four scenarios because people uh, yeah. always want me to talk about the future. Maybe at some point I should do that. But you've you've raised the network monarchy question, so let me just explain briefly what you know what I originally meant by the network monarchy, which was an article that. That was published in 2005 and so things have changed uh, and the monarch has changed since then so all is not exactly as it was um, so the distinctive elements in the argument and i'm going to write another article about network monarchy revisited to try to explain a what i meant by network monarchy for those who don't seem to follow the idea completely and b to respond to those who have both used and abused uh, the concept over the years i'm very flattered by the attention that this concept has received but you know one of the fun things about the flattery of people picking up your concept is they tend to turn out to be meaning something slightly different from it from what you originally meant in the first place. Uh, rightly or wrongly, maybe they saw something in it I never saw. So it's taken on a life of its own, which I guess is great. Um, so there are two things that are really important about network monarchy. One is the network. It's an argument that you don't have to focus just on what the palace or what specifically the king is doing. You can look at what all kinds of other people around the palace or around the king do, quote unquote, on the king's behalf, which would include the military, the courts, the bureaucracy, um, uh, of course, very importantly, the Privy Council uh, and so forth. And then a second thing that's extremely important, though, and this is the bit that people tend to be focusing on less over time, and that I would like to bring back to the fore, is network monarchy was focused on 
at least in my mind, and I need to go back and really read the original article again and make sure I spell this out clearly enough, is focused on the difficulty of pinning down agency. Because the network monarchy uh, in the last reign of King Bhumipan was a kind of black box. Uh, he didn't really directly give orders very much about what should or shouldn't be done. He gave speeches which were often a little bit difficult to read. They were, they were sort of rather like a Buddhist monk talking where he'd, he'd expound all this wisdom, but then people would sit around uh, interpreting his wisdom in different ways. Uh, and that gave a lot of scope to all these different people in the network to implement uh, what he had sort of told them to do in different ways and produced quite a lot of problems as a result because some people would take a particular speech as a signal that you know there should be a crackdown or, or a coup or a political party should be abolished and then other people could construe it a completely different way. So there was a lot of ambiguity uh, about the way agency was exercised which allowed the different elements of the network to freelance. And this was one of the main points I was trying to make in the article, which got a little bit lost. And other people tried to make it a much, much tighter concept where, you know, it's all a conspiracy. It's all you know, very, very managed. Now, of course, things have changed in Thailand since the onset of the new reign at the end of 2016. Um, the network is still there. All those elements are still very much in place. The agency question, though, is the one that needs to be revisited because we have much less sense that the elements of the network have independent agency to interpret royal wishes uh, according to their own whim. That's not happening nearly so much. Nowadays, we're much more inclined to assume that what the network monarchy does is what the monarch wants. And that, it, again, it's a bit of a black box because we don't get very many explicit public statements, but most people who study these things and are much more well informed about them than I am, would argue that the things that are emanating from the, the network monarchy these days are more directly reflective of the royal will than was the case in the previous reign. So that's that's kind of that part. And what was the next bit of the question? <laughs> Sorry. About what was the next bit of the question? So why, why, don't, why don't they just cannot, if it, this this yes. only strengthens my point that if right. there's a, a less uh, pluralism within the network mm -hmm. monarchy than before, and it's coming emanating from a single will, yeah. but it c commands all of the instruments of power that there are. Right. And they're ample because it's a large, well trained military. Right. Um, why can't they simply crush this movement, even if it's a very widely popular movement? Right. See, that's a really good question, but it might not follow that way. For example, the military had uh, a crack, you know, carried out a crackdown and killed a significant number of red shirt protesters in April and May 2010, um, at the sort of still very much the period of the old network monarchy. And because of the particular circumstances of, of that violent suppression, the monarchy was never really blamed for what happened. The advantage of the network monarchy is if agency is not explicitly spelled out, then blame is not explicitly assigned. So if the military does something which they may or may not be doing uh, on behalf of the palace, but the palace doesn't kind of have its name all over it, then um, that might work. It's much more difficult now because everybody would see a crackdown as being very, very closely associated with the entire uh, network and with the monarchy itself. So it will be very, very difficult to escape from being blamed. And that is not a happy situation for any Thai monarch to be in. They would rather subcontract uh, responsibility for any dark deeds that have to be carried out to somebody else. And that has become much, much more difficult now. So actually that could be a positive in a strange way in this situation, if I'm making sense. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned four scenarios, but before we get to them, what you've just said now makes me wanna ask about the legitimation of the monarchy. So as I have understood that it is quasi-religious, it is linked up with the very fervent and sincere Buddhist beliefs of most of the Thai population, which would make it somewhat 
um, resilient, this legitimation, even if the monarch was held responsible for some heinous deeds, that there's a, there's right. a deeper, a deeper legitimation that's in the religion that's hard to get. And people are not getting, not abandoning the religion. So, uh, uh, can you sort that out? And then I do think, you know, probably our audience would love to hear the four scenarios as we come right. toward the <laughs> end of our time. Yes. We have only a few minutes left, but uh, I always love to hear scenarios. Usually three is enough, but if you got right. four, go for four. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, the basis of legitimation is, is very, very complicated um, because, you know, well, I know constructivism isn't so popular in, <laughs> in the US, but there is a sense in which there's a lot of social constructivism involved. Um, mm. The monarchy was, has not always been popular. It, it, the, pop, the, the recent phenomenon of extreme popularity of the Thai monarchy is something that is a product of fairly systematic uh, efforts over the past 60 years or so. Uh, but, you know, the the way the monarchy has been working in recent decades, um, there's been so much government effort to propping up what Tong Shai Wen Ishikun calls this culture of hyper-royalism that people have, have find it difficult to dissociate themselves from this. And now we can come up with a religious explanation, but I honestly think that that's only part of the story here. Part of the story is that there's a, a systematic attempt to propagate certain kinds of national myths and to propagate beliefs in the centrality of monarchy and that that has been deeply inculcated into people through a whole range of mechanisms. Um, so you don't have to, 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 to buy into the whole idea of the Dharma Raja and the benevolent Buddhist king and so on to, um, you know, to have this question of legitimacy take on, to assume a form which is beyond rationality. And, th and this is the whole problem here. So, you know, when we focus on constitutional reform and, and political reform, what do you do about an institution that exists in space that greatly exceeds the boundaries of the constitution and greatly exceeds the space of legal rationality? I think this is the, the problem that you're, that you're pointing to here. Uh, and it's really, really hard to deal with uh, an institution whose very existence transcends the bounds of legal rationality because all we, uh, you know, political scientists or, or, or lawyers or politicians or whatever, public intellectuals or st student protesters can do really is come up with ideas of attempting to bound institutions within a framework of legal rationality. It's incredibly difficult to deal with the, the the framework beyond the boundaries of legal rationality, which also comes into play in terms of this legitimation. So I'm not sure I've really answered your question very well, but this is a, this is really the fundamental problem. You could change the constitution in any way you like. You could invent any institutions you liked. Uh, you could do all sorts of things, but where you have people who are operating beyond uh, legal bureaucratic rational boundaries, um, and they're, they're able to do that because of well-established social beliefs, how, however precisely those beliefs were constructed. Um, it's just not going to go away very easily. Very interesting. <laughs> okay, yes. so very one, of our, one of our listeners is uh, prodding uh, me to uh, ask you to definitely talk about your four scenarios. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, I probably should open the book to remind myself exactly what the four scenarios were. The great thing about having four is then you can do this map, uh, which <laughs> we have on page 168. So then your four scenarios are there and you can plot where you think on this map between the four scenarios Thailand currently is. You can move your dot around it. So you can print this out, give it to your students and they can debate, you know, where on the matrix Thailand is uh, now and in the past and will be, you know, five years from now and all that stuff. So, the, um, the matrix of the four scenarios, obviously this is a book focusing on future forward, but you can also reinterpret them slightly to, uh, to a post future forward um, world, if you like. So one is what we call Pax Tanaton, which is basically a, a progressive future where people like Tanaton, the future forward party have a place where they can be rehabilitated, where you might see a rolling back of power of the military and the monarchy and, you know, 
future forward or some version of it could be reincarnated and brought back and the values of these young new Asian cosmopolitans could come to the fore. Um, second scenario we call status quo continues. It basically goes on more or less as it is now, which is a sort of stalemate between the different sides. Third scenario is the darkest scenario, which we call perfect storm, where things really start to descend into chaos. So you imagine these, these protests go on and degenerate into, into violence, as you were sort of hinting in one of your earlier questions. I'm always very reluctant to predict things degenerating into violence, but we have to acknowledge the possibility of that as a, as a scenario. Um, and I've, of course, been working on that ongoing violent insurgency in the Deep South, which is like an extreme version of some of these contradictions in wider Thai society. Uh, and then the fourth scenario, which we end on, is Pax establishment. Um, and that's sort of the scenario you were hinting at, that the conservative establishment gets the upper hand. It finds ways of continuing to suppress uh, those who are asking awkward questions and doing awkward things on the streets and carrying giant uh, yellow rubber ducks around and all the things, the, the very entertaining and creative things that the student protesters are doing, uh, finds ways of controlling the digital online world and suppressing all these um, digital natives and Generation Z and essentially forcing them to toe a line and, and getting them to kind of give up trying very seriously anymore to resist um, the dominance of uh, traditional power institutions. So yeah, those are the, those are the four scenarios from the most positive to the, uh, the, the there's a positive scenario if you, if you think that progressive change would be good, that is, uh, status quo scenario, dark scenario of descending into chaos, and then Pax establishment, which is basically uh, the ruling elite gets a grip on what's going on now and uh, is able to enforce its will going forward. So the, the status quo scenario is not very stable, right? I mean, some of these things are not endpoints, but intermediate steps. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the scenarios aren't all incompatible. You could certainly have the status quo continuing for a certain period of time and then moving in sharply in one of the other directions after, a, say, a year or two or three. Yeah. So... One is, I mean, after, uh, at, at the end of this conversation, I find myself feeling pretty pessimistic. Right. <laughs> uh, because your first scenario is one in which there is progressive change. Presumably the military junta goes out, the monarchy right. is subjected to constitutional limits. And yeah, I just, I think you've more or less said that you don't see a pathway to that outcome. Well, I don't know. I mean, honestly, when we gave the, we we did two weeks ago at um, Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand a book launch, and which four thousand six hundred people watched on Facebook Live to our amazement. And my co-author Anurat was asked the very same question, and she said, "Absolutely, the right scenario is the first one. It's going to be." Pax Tanator is going to be the progressive outcome. We might not get the progressive outcome now, but the logic is uh, that in a certain number of years, these kids will be running the country. Uh, so okay. you might be able to suppress them temporarily, but ultimately the logic of digital nativity must triumph. And that's why the elite are scared to death. So the logic is that uh, the old people die and the young people survive, but that's a little bit different from asking for a pathway to that outcome. In other words, what steps yeah. can one That's envision? Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, because the military also has young people in it and they mm -hmm. rise up in the ranks and the monarch is not that old. And yeah, I mean, in the long run, we're all dead, et cetera. But how, how could that come about? That's well, not 68. Yeah. Um, but yes, of course, there are, there are young conservative people who will come to the fore to replace anybody who, who moves on. Uh, there's, something, there's something in that. Um, look, 
I, I agree that I don't see exactly how we could how you could easily implement the kind of aspirations that first of all the Future Forward Party and now the progressive whatever you want to call them uh, youth and student movement and their allies are advancing how that how that could really happen. Um, but at the same time, I think the idea that you could just suppress them and they would go away is equally problematic because Thailand is not China. It has this much more open society. Uh, it has a different kind of political tradition. It's very engaged with the world. Um, you know, I, I don't think that people will just go quiet in the way that um, the authorities might want them to. It'd be, it's, it's much, much more difficult to manage. It's a much more complicated place than somewhere like Hong Kong. <clears throat> okay, well, I think that's probably a good place and it is about time for us to end it. I, Duncan, I thank you so much. I mean, you're really the uniquely qualified person to inform us about all these things in great depth. And I'm happy that you could end the conversation with a note of optimism that, yeah. uh, and uh, to leaven my pessimism um, and to tell me that Thailand is not China. That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. So on behalf of, do you, have, do you want to say something in closing? But on behalf of all of our listeners, I just want to thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, Andy. This has been great. And thanks for, uh, you know, we talked before about whether we could do this as a conversation and not just me giving one of my academic lectures, which of course I, I love nothing more than standing up in front of people and telling them stuff for an hour because I'm a professor. But uh, <laughs> I think Luke, We've, we've all done so many Zoom things now that we're trying to find ways of making this more lively and interesting. And I think you, we really um, managed to do it. We went, we went with the flow and it worked. So that's, that's been great. It's been a lot of fun to have this conversation. Right. It's like the two of us were just having brunch like we were a few months ago when I could still travel to New York. It's just we mm -hmm. had a lot of people listening. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much.